Hello and welcome to today's webinar on risk adequacy hosted by CalcuRisk and ComplyPort. My name is Jonathan Greenstein. I'm joined today by Gerard Joyce, Chief Technology Officer, and Tom Healy, Director both within CalcuRisk, and Richard Revor, Associate Director from ComplyPort. A quick bit of housekeeping. On your screen at the bottom, you should see a button that allows you to submit a question type of Q&A. Please do so as and when you have any questions. We will save them all to the end and answer them one by one. I will now pass across to Tom, who will introduce you to today's webinar. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, all, and welcome to our webinar on risk adequacy and a risk-based approach to assessing the adequacy of financial resources. This webinar was prompted by the FCA's consultation paper, 1920, titled Our Framework, Assessing Adequate Financial Resources which closed for comments on the 13th of September 2019, and a policy statement from the FCA will follow later this year. Presenting and discussing this subject today are Richard Revel and Gerard Joyce. Richard is the risk leader at ComplyPort, a leading compliance and regulatory consultancy providing bespoke practical solutions for all manner of regulated firms, both in the UK and overseas. Richard has responsibility for ComplyPort's FinTech and RegTech practice areas and also operates as a consultant on governance, risk and compliance matters. Gerard Joyce is the CTO and Director of Risk Management at CalcuRisk, who provide a governance, risk and compliance software solution to the financial services sector. For the past 15 years, Gerard has been studying, engaging in and writing about risk management. He has worked with financial institutions, public sector, and other organizations to develop tools and techniques to better manage risk. Jared also sits on a number of international risk bodies technical committees. I hope you will find this presentation informative and afterwards we will allow some time for questions. I will now hand over to Richard to kick things off. Richard? Good morning, Tom. Thank you very much indeed. That's a, a nice introduction. Um, okay, CP1920. Um, as the previous slide stated, and as Tom introduced, um, the consulting period for CP1920 has, uh, has now closed, and we can expect policy statement and rule information from the FCA uh, by the end of the year, or at least that's what the, uh, the date that was given, and was you know, this morning, indeed, was given on the FCA's website. Um, so, what do we take from CP1920? Um, well, it does say quite a lot. Um, basically, it covers ostensibly the roles of assessing adequate financial resources. Um, it describes what the FCA looks for from firms when assessing those, uh, those resources, and the FCA's expectations as to uh, the practices firms should adopt in their assessment. Um, now, that's all fairly high level, uh, but reading between the lines, um, I think the take home we want to discuss today is that this applies to all firms. Um, basically, threshold conditions and principles are um, mandatory for all firms, and therefore all firms are expected are going to be affected by CP1920. Um, and the other thing we take away from it is that CP1920 talks a lot about risk and risk management. Um, now, this does form a consistent picture with what we've been seeing um, with ICAP. Um, for those of you who don't know, ICAP is basically the documentation of capital adequacy and to a certain extent also liquidity um, adequacy processes that firms under by pro and if pro sections of the handbook are expected to carry out. Basically, capital financial adequacy is not solely driven by mandatory calculations. So, moving on, let's have a look at uh, principles. First of all, as I've said before, principles apply to all firms. Now, financial adequacy, um, that's principle number four, uh, is a fairly obvious one. A firm must maintain adequate financial resources. And depending on the uh, nature of the firm and the FCA's risk rating of that firm, uh, these can be quite complex calculations or these can be quite straightforward calculations. Um, and certainly below, if you like, the ICAP threshold, most firms will probably leave it at that. Um, they will make sure they have the minimum stipulated by the, uh, by the FCA in their part of the handbook. However, principle three 
Um, this is possibly uh, the, the, if you like, the, uh, the stealth message that's coming through here. Um, a firm must take responsible care to organize and control its affairs responsibly and effectively with adequate risk management systems. So now you can start to see a link to the risk and risk-based approach to financial adequacy for all firms across the board. It's, it's always been there, but I think CP1920 starts, uh, starts to make this a, a little bit more of a focus. Now, if we quickly talk about the risk side of things, um, within CP1920, the word risk actually appears 136 times, uh, and that's in 45 pages, two of which are front and back covers. So, Clearly, risk is a big thing within this document. Um, it has been an area of increasing emphasis from the FCA, and uh, under these proposed rules, or certainly this consultancy, um, it's looking like the FCA will start to uh, certainly be able to request any firm to submit its risk-based assessment of adequate financial resources for review. Um, they will always have been able to do this, but again, it's been uh, underlined within this within this consultancy paper, and presumably will be ratified by the uh, policy document that follows it. Um, and this, of course, covers firms which are not currently required to put on an ICAP. Um, so this is definitely turning up the burners. Uh, effectively, again, the message is mandatory adequacy on its own is not sufficient. Firms will have to look inwards and uh, carry out risk assessments to justify whether that mandatory calculation is sufficient or whether they require further capital over and above the, uh, the threshold minimum that the FCA provides. So uh, let's just go back to ICAP briefly. Um, obviously, it doesn't apply to all firms, as I've said before, but it's a good illustrative model of where the FCA appears to be heading. Um, Firms under CID3 and CID4, the BICRU and IFCRU firms that I mentioned, are required to uh, perform an internal capital adequacy assessment process. And this generally is a year cycle activity, um, and it's to be documented, and the, the document just generally gets called the ICAP. It's a fairly, uh, fairly eponymous document. Um, the FCA can ask to review this on an ad hoc basis, and uh, they will usually give a firm 14 days to provide this document. So uh, it's not an easy one to rustle up in a hurry, um, and so most firms have ICAP standing by. Um, the ICAP contains two parallel capital adequacy tests, which are referred to as Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Um, pillar 1 represents mandatory and prescriptive calculations of requirements as specified by the FCA. And Pillar 2 represents the firm's own internal view of its requirements, um, and these derive from the risk framework that the firm is expected to have. Um, this is enshrined further within um, provisions in CISC, CISC 20, um, some of which apply at the moment only to uh, the BICRO and IFCRU firms. Um, but as I've said, this, this message occurring through CP 1920 is basically pushing this, uh, this requirement down the, uh, down the risk stack, as it were. Um, so, what is the state of play with firms that are familiar with this processing um, and ICAP? Well, over the last two years, um, we've seen uh, the ICAP being used almost as a, a, a canary in a coal mine. Um, the CFD sector of, uh, of firms has been, uh, has been generally under scrutiny for a couple of years, and uh, the FCA has been uh, asking for ICAP um, from those firms. Um, when CRD4 came in, um, the FCA went on something of a roadshow um, and uh, started to identify where they were dissatisfied with the ICAP that uh, BICRU firms at the time were providing. They singled out um, four main areas. The first area was that uh, the risk appetite that is stated within, uh, within the ICAP was very often um, poorly articulated. Uh, it was almost as if there was a stock phrase that firms would just say their risk appetite was low and that this was evinced by their uh, robust governance and uh, management systems. Now, of course, just by saying your risk appetite is low doesn't really mean anything because uh, low is obviously low compared to what. Um, and furthermore, uh, there's no numbers in there. That's just a very weak qualitative um, description of uh, description of appetite um, and doesn't really tell the FCA anything. 
Um, the next thing that would happen is that because of a methodology called Pillar 1 Plus, Pillar 2 was generally just skated over. Um, firms would look at Pillar 1, stick a finger in the air and say, well, that's good enough. We don't need to add any extra capital on the Pillar 2, full stop. Um, so, <laughs> unsurprisingly, this was regarded as insufficient and inconsistent. Um, reverse stress testing, that, uh, that also was absent in a lot of ICAP. Reverse stress testing is where a firm basically looks at its business model, sees where um, the, the Armageddon risk crystallization could arrive, i.e. the game over black swan event, and works back from that to try and mitigate and control any uh, causes that uh, could lead to this, um, and then push it through a financial projection and stress test to identify exactly where those, uh, those boundaries were. This hasn't been done in all ICAPs and is mandatory through CISC 20.2. Um, and finally, wind down plans, when things go horribly wrong and the firm does have to wind down, um, over optimistic time horizons and lack of realistic planning were, uh, were another thing that the FCA picked up there. Um, so, when it finds that uh, an ICAP is lacking, what, what happens? Um, well, the FCA can go back to the firm and basically say, we do not think you understand your capital requirements and we are going to give you individual capital guidance. Um, and this can be quite painful. Um, and of course, come December, there is, uh, there is the individual responsibility angle to this from, uh, from SNCR. Now, I said earlier in this slide, uh, we've seen CFD trading space coming under scrutiny, um, and we picked up a, a number of unhappy clients at that point. They weren't, they weren't clients before this, but their uh, ICAPs were deemed to be inadequate by the FCA, and I've got a, a grab bag selection of these here. Um, the headline one, of course, is uh, firm number one. Now, firm number one, who shall remain anonymous, um, they got, in terms of an individual capital guidance, of 412% of their existing Pillar 1 calculation. Um, to translate that into numbers, imagine if your firm was quite happily running at what you thought was, uh, was adequate, half a million, and uh, the RCA has now come in and said you need, uh, you need north of two million um, on that. So that's not going to be a particularly uh, pleasant hit to the business plan, nor is it going to be a particularly uh, wonderful hit to the, uh, the owners of the firm. Um, in the main, we've been seeing a doubling of Pillar 1 for other firms, um, and the inadequacies and things the FCA pointed out, whilst varying between firms, again, do cluster very much around those predictive warnings that, uh, that we saw way back when uh, CRD4 came in. Um, now, that's ICAP firms for you. Um, effectively, some ICAPs are good, a lot of ICAPs are bad, and uh, a great number of ICAPs do not necessarily uh, satisfy the FCA from their, uh, from their risk treatments. How does this translate to non-ICAP firms? Well, of course, there's always proportionality, um, but uh, it's fairly clear that by splitting firms into three groups at the uh, cost-benefit analysis section at the end of the document, uh, class 3 are basically the 45,000 firms who do not have to supply an ICAP to the FCA on demand. Um, they may be subject to our review of their own assessment of adequate financial resources on an ad hoc basis. And uh, clearly this is, um, this is you know, it's, it's a warning. The FCA expects firms to have some sort of risk management framework in place, um, no matter how small the firm is. Um, now, I can say that pushing strongly encouraging and, uh, and the others. Um, this can be or could feel quite daunting to firms. Um, if you've got experience with ICAP, um, you know, you, 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 can, you can accommodate this. Uh, but a lot of firms who haven't had ICAP may not necessarily have gone through this thought process um, and will probably be asking where, where they start. Um, well, the good news is that it's not as bad as it seems. Um, the risk framework simply formalizes all aspects of the risk to business basis, and it is more or less likely that um, the senior management actually running the firm will have the various components of this already. Um, it may not be formalized within a risk management framework, but certainly in their, in their heads and general understanding, the, uh, the information will exist. Um, putting it within a framework 
then very simply allows the firm to communicate its understanding of these risks in a recognized manner to the SCA. And it also turns out to be quite a useful thought exercise for senior management. Instead of being, uh, being sort of uh, siloed within a, a thought process which involves P&L and uh, income statements only, this is a far wider view of what might be down the road. Um, so we actually think it's a very good idea whether firms are regulated or not. Um, generally running a business, uh, you should be uh, proactively looking out for what can go wrong down the road. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague Gerard. And Gerard is going to uh, take us through um, a little bit more of a mechanical and procedural um, perspective on how to set up a risk framework. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to translate or transfer control over to you. Just wait one moment. Okay, Gerard, you have control. Gerard, can you yes. please unmute? Uh, Thank you. Okay, I'm there. Uh, good morning. Uh, useful thought exercise was the last uh, sentence on your slide. I, I hope you're saying that with tongue in cheek, Richard, because it, of course it is much more as we will see. Uh, if I said it will save you money, then I'm sure you'll all be interested. So let's have a look. I'm going to talk, I'm going to describe what a risk-based approach is, uh, define it and how it benefits an organization. And then I'm going to apply that approach to assessing the financial resources of an organization. And I would preface it by saying to know what financial resources you need, you first need to understand what risks you're taking on. So what is a risk-based approach? The regulator would say that you need to identify, assess, manage, and monitor risks that can have an impact on your financial resources. That is uh, certainly one definition. And the start of that is understanding the organization the structure, the internal and external environment, who your partners, who, what are the dependencies. We'll have a look at that in greater detail later. You need to understand the needs and expectations of stakeholders, like regulators, investors, boards of directors, clients, and what requirements they have. To give you focus, you need to be clear on the objectives of, of doing the risk management. And I might start with the objectives of the organization, but in particular, the objectives for this risk-based approach. When you describe the scope, when you describe the organization, you've already started describing the risk management framework, um, the scope that is going to cover. But then you need to, before you start assessing risks, you need to develop risk criteria. And that is simply the terms of reference against which you're going to measure the level of each risk. If you use a one to five scale from very low, low, medium, high, very high, you need to define what do you mean by uh, each of those numbers. And as Richard already said, risk appetite is something that the regulator is um, unhappy with. Uh, and certainly in my experience, I have found more poorly articulated risk appetites than in good ones. Um, we could maybe Richard uh, at some future date do a webinar just on risk appetite. Um, but it's for me, it's a mixture of qualitative statements saying like we have zero tolerance for something or we won't do something or, you know, those statements without numbers. But equally, it needs to have a number of numbers in there, operational limits that you will not pass. Um, and we'll see that, uh, see that later. Knowing that you can start then assessing your risks. You've already identified the scope and, and where they are to be found. Um, and finally, and the risk assessment will generate a risk, a list of ranked risks and enable you to prioritize the action, actions that you need to take to address any gaps in the risks. Yes, Richard, I, mean, I, I, I sense you have a comment here. Yeah, I, um, I was just going to add that um, certainly our, uh, our experience here, we tend to encourage firms to start off by uh, constructing a, a risk vocabulary, which is definitely in your assess risk by identifying. Um, but the vocabulary is certainly uh, a very useful start whereby uh, management can uh, look at the different aspects of the firm that they want to measure um, and then that goes across to the uh, risks or risk category the SCA understands. 
Um, so that's a, that's another little piece that we do within the financial <coughs> services side of things. Thank you for that. So how does it benefit your firm? Well, first and foremost, a structured and systematic approach will give you, you greater trust in the results, give the regulator greater trust, your clients a greater trust in it. The alternative is that, and, and Richard alluded to this as well, that you probably have a lot of this in individual departments, the so-called silo approach, where everybody does their bit. The, the risk with that is, of course, that you have a lot of gaps between the stools. By being proactive and going out to identify your risks and understand what risks you are carrying, because unidentified risks are ones you're carrying unwittingly. If you're proactive and in the long run, you're going to have less cost because uh, you're fixing it before it breaks. Transparency is a requirement by the regulator, but transparency is a, uh, a laudable goal as well. A risk-based approach uh, will allow you to demonstrate um, to the stakeholders, be it the regulator or your clients, that you have the adequate financial resources um, based on the risks that you've assessed. And if further down the road you are subject to um, some legal action, litigation, you're being sued, or the regulator is uh, unhappy with some aspect of your organisation, I feel and um, there is evidence that if you can demonstrate that you have good risk management um, systems in place, um, controls in place, then you will be treated um, less harshly or um, and the fines will be uh, consequently less. Yes, I think, um, I think you're right there. Um, the FCA operates an outcomes-based um, regulatory regime. And, uh, you know, the, the, the corollary of that or the consequence of that is that if it hasn't been written down, it, it never happened. Um, and if you can't point to evidence that you were running the company in a responsible way, then the censure will be uh, that much greater. You know, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Um, having, having a risk-based approach will uh, uh, enable the board to get the confirmation on the effectiveness of policies and procedures and controls. Um, from December the 9th, I think the senior managers will also be interested in getting that confirmation when the senior managers regime uh, kicks in. And finally, the process of uh, formally assessing risk and assigning responsibility does uh, generate, I would say, a positive culture of ownership uh, of risk. And uh, this is to be welcomed. Um, that if people uh, in their day-to-day -day job um, see the risk management as part of their, their job. I will summarize this slide by saying, if you reduce the risk, you will reduce the financial resources required, very simply. So let's apply the risk-based approach now to, um, in, in greater detail, to financial, assessing financial resources. Understand the organization the internal and external environment that you're working, the business processes, what are critical, what are important, what are their key dependencies in terms of systems, maybe it's vendors, partners. Risk may not just lie within your walls of, of, of where you reside, but they could reside with your partners. If your partners should fail, does it bring down your organization? You need to know this. So understand the organization, understand the systems. And again, the regulator here in CP 1920, um, it talks about the failure of systems and controls uh, which might cause harm to consumers. Uh, it's not just actions of people, systems do fail. And be aware of all your legal and regulatory requirements. And I would add into that as well, any contractual obligations you have to clients. Don't just do this for the legal and regulatory side and for what you have to. It's, it's good to do for your business. Be clear on the expectations of all your stakeholders. First of all, identify them, you know, is it clients, is it regulators? Um, the board, uh, the senior managers, and, and what the expectations are. If you are, articulate all of that first, you're on a good road to identifying the risks. But again, before you start identifying the risks, I would say articulate your objectives. Your objectives for this exercise, you could start with the objectives of the organization, but where are you going to apply the, 
the risk assessment and risk management. I'm just putting up here four examples of how you might articulate those objectives. It might be a simple comply with all applicable regulations, minimize harm to consumers, no harm to have a, an objective to reduce costs. Uh, and if you there are a number of ways that this approach will help you reduce costs apart from identifying gaps in controls and preventing losses before they happen. If you have to comply with multiple regulations, um, you will find that there is overlap in these regulations and the requirements. So doesn't it make sense to gather all of these together and understand what your obligations are and do it once and do it right? Uh, Richard, I don't know if you have a comment on, on that where you see maybe people in organizations um, have initiated multiple projects when uh, it could have been much more efficient to um, understand the commonalities between them first. Yes, I, I, we, we definitely have. Um, the most obvious example would be when GDPR came in um, and we found that a number of clients were doing almost parallel risk frameworks, one for the, uh, one for the IT department and one from the compliance department. Um, and they weren't necessarily uh, looking at the overlap together. Um, we would imagine that, um, that this, sort of, uh, <laughs> this sort of approach should, if applied across, um, across an organization, certainly reduce that sort of um, reinvention of the wheel within each silo. Um, so yes, it, it, it has been my experience in, in actually quite large firms as well. Thank you for that. The, the next one, improved decision making. And in, in CP1920, the, the regulator um, requires that the assessment process meets the use test. And by use test, they mean, is it used in day-to-day -day decision making? And let me, let me give you an analogy. Um, if, you, if you're driving a Lamborghini, you wish, and you know that the brakes are good, you might be tempted to put the boot to the floor and drive it to its max. So if you know your controls are good in an organization, if you know that you have good policies, good procedures, people are well trained, then maybe you can afford to take more risk. The way I describe it is brakes allow a car to go fast. So have good controls and know you have good controls. Know when you're making a decision that the controls that are in place are good. So let's move on to assessing and, and addressing the risks. There is internationally a well-regarded uh, well and widely used approach, which I've shown in a graphic here to the right. It's from the ISO 31000 standard. And we're just focusing on the risk assessment bit. The, the first step is to identify the risks. And there are different techniques for, for maybe listing them, but I would start with just writing the list so you can, you can categorize them later. And it might be, failure of a counterparty, it might be fraud, it might be a rogue trader, it might be a cyber attack. Um, you need to try and cast the net as wide as possible to fully understand the risks you face and then start analyzing them and realize which ones should you really need to worry about. The analysis is, is understanding what controls are in place and are they effective um, and are there gaps or the things you need to do. When you understand the risk, then you can decide, um, that's the evaluation step, whether you can accept the risk as it is or whether you need to treat it. That is, uh, take some action to uh, reduce the risk further. The appetite comes into play here again, because what is an acceptable risk? If you, if you say, well, we, won't, we don't accept any risk that would... Um, push the level of consequences above, let's say, a 3.5 in, in a 1 to 5 scale. And you might put a number on that. It might, be, it might be a fine, it might be a loss, whatever way you want to articulate that. Then, by your own definition, this risk is outside your appetite and you need to address uh, the risk. Now, we've often been asked to explain to people um, in... in um, diagrammatically how uh, a risk assessment might be conducted. And there are about 25 techniques um, out there, but this is, is probably the one that um, is more readily understandable. It's called the bow tie technique for obvious reasons. 
And at the center of the bow tie in the knot, you place the event of the circumstances that are undesirable, that you wish to avoid. And everything to the left of that knot are things you do to prevent the occurrence um, of, of these events or circumstances. Everything to the right, you do to lessen the severity of the, of the event or the circumstances. That is the English definition of the word mitigation. Mitigation has two meanings in risk, but in this, in this sense, mitigation after the event is lessening the severity of. Now, Richard spoke about um, reverse stress testing, and I thought you could use this as well to explain that. If you move the knot in this bow tie completely over to the right, so you have a very lopsided bow tie, you have one risk, which is the total collapse, the Armageddon of the organization. And everything to the left is things you could or should have done to prevent it. Now, if you move the knot to the right, you're asking yourself the question, what could lead to this total collapse? And you might start with, well, it was a fraud or it was a cyber attack. And you start listing out the risks. And guess what? If, if you... If, if I was to move one step to the left from the right, I might have five risks and I've moved two steps where I, I would see this, you probably have 30 to 50 risks. And that is about the level of granularity that, that I find uh, works best for companies where they can focus on a particular risk and the controls to minimize that risk. So let's apply now this bow tie to a particular risk. So you see it in practice. And the risk is, is fraud, a simple, um, employee fraud. On the left-hand side, you look at what could cause this fraud, where, where, where could it come from? And it might be employee embezzlement, it might be somebody getting kickbacks um, for, for favours, it might be somebody stealing a client's identity and using that to, to uh, make themselves rich. Or it could be as simple as fraudulent expense claim. Identify the causes and then consider what controls you would put in place. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but just an example. You start, to my mind, always with a policy. Have a policy in place, because that guides the procedures and the training and the education. But then you need to check. You need to check that people are following the procedures, that the policy is being complied with. And you need to have things, if we don't want employee fraud, like authorization limits. Obviously, you, um, it's a self-explanatory word, limit. You're going to limit the exposure. And segregation of duties, that the, the same person can't both create a purchase order and, and write the, the check for the invoice. Um, some common sense things like strong access control to systems and only giving people access to what they need to do their job uh, is clear. And, and whistleblowing, that if something is going awry that you want the people who can see it to be able to report it. How else will you know if fraud is going on? And that's where detection comes in at the center. Is it first, the first you know about it is when a customer tells you, or is it the annual audit and it's been going on for nine months and you didn't know? So think about that as well and think about how you might detect when an event or circumstance has come about. Because um, if I was to scare you and say that the Ponemon Institute say that a, a cyber attack where somebody is, has gotten inside your systems and is looking around and leaking data out of your systems. They can be in your systems for up to 204 days before they're detected. And that's kind of scary because that's a lot of information lost in that time. But when you do find out that you have maybe a data breach or a fraud, that's not the time to start writing your response plan. I would say you write the plan uh, now. You write the plan before um, it happens. It is uncomfortable to think about these things, um, because it's a scenario that you don't want to consider, but have a plan because you will save time later. And if you've got to report to the regulator within 72 hours and come back to your customers, um, you won't have the time to be writing a plan. I always think that those people who have a plan will be and will appear to be in control in a crisis situation. So that will stand to you later. Some concluding remarks from me, and I might get Richard maybe to, to comment as well. Um, yes, the regulation is a major driver to adopt a structured, uh, systematic risk management process. But I think also that there is client pressure and I would say just good business reasons for having a structured approach. Uh, certainly, it enables you to identify 
and address the key risks and the gaps. And why wouldn't you want to do that and fix the gaps um, before they become a problem? I don't know, uh, Richard, if, if, if this is something you want to comment on at this stage. Um, yes, I mean, it's, it, it, it goes back to um, my comment about uh, it's, it's a very proactive process. Um, whilst you were off driving your Lamborghini at huge speeds down the autobahn, very happy that your brakes work, um, I'd also add that you know the windscreen is there because quite often the problems that occur are, uh, are the other guy's fault. And of course, looking through the windscreen is a very good way to uh, to prepare. You. So I'm just gilding your uh, your metaphor there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. The um, when when people look at risk management and they think if I have 50 risks and my, the assessment tells me I got 150 things I need to do, it can be a bit scary. But remember. The, the process is a risk-based one so that the biggest risks will appear to the top and the remedial actions you take um, should be and, and I'm sure will be prioritized taking the level of risk into account. So you address the biggest risks first. Um, finally, I would say if you understand the risks that you're running and through this process you will, then you will be able to demonstrate to the regulator and to others that you have the appropriate, and that's, that's the important word, not too much, not too little, but the appropriate level of capital available should things go awry. Thank you for listening. I'm going to hand back One, now to... Yes, I'm just going to take back control now. So thank you very much. I'm going to see if we have any questions. Um, if you have any questions again, please can you submit them to the Q&A section below. Um, we have one question here. What is non-executive director's involvement and responsibility in this? How does the FCA look at net accountability on this? Um, well, the non-executive director um, role exists to provide independent challenge um, to the, uh, the incumbent senior management and, and board. Um, they should definitely um, have input within the construction of a, of a risk framework. Um, whilst Gerard was talking at the end, um, one of the things I saw um, that perhaps wasn't, uh, wasn't necessarily fully underlined, um, but when we look at, uh, look at firms, and certainly the, the, the firms that I come in contact with, they, they do have a heap of policies and a heap of procedures and there are business continuity plans and all the rest of it. And of course, the risk framework um, ties us all together with the risks that the firm faces and actually gives these things context. Um, Non-executive directors should be given access to this basically to uh, provide independent challenges. It's, it's quite often very easy not to see the wood for the trees when you're, when you're actually in the thick of uh, the operations and running of a firm. Gerard, do you have any, uh, any further views on that? Just that uh, the the UK corporate governance uh, code um, says, and it doesn't distinguish between executive and non-executive, but that directors have a responsibility and must attest as to the effectiveness of the risk management system and internal controls. So uh, at some point, all of the directors are putting their name to a document saying that they are effective. And as you say, they, they, must, they must challenge in, in, in a constructive way. So yes, equally on the hook. Great, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any further questions coming in. So what I'll do is I'll conclude today's webinar. As you can actually probably see in the bottom left-hand side, in the left-hand side box there, we are going to be having a free online demonstration of some of the tools um, that you can help you with your um, your risks um, on the 21st of November at 11 o'clock. Um, if you would like to register your interest, obviously the button on your screen doesn't work at the moment, but it will do when we send it out. Additionally, if you would like these slides, feel free to email um, either Richard, Tom, Ger or Gerard, if you have their details, or myself. Uh, my email address is J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N dot greenstein green light the color s-t-e-i-n at complyport.co.uk um uh, we've actually had one last question come in very quickly 
What are your views on the use of modeling techniques for op risk in ICAP? Gerard, do you have a, a view or shall I, uh, shall I take this one? I'll let you take this one, Richard. Okay. Um, one, of the, one of the issues um, that uh, I've always had with ICAP and one of the things that I, I use as uh, possible leverage to encourage um, more deeper adoption of, um, of the pillar two side of things is that operational risk um, within by crew and if crew um, on the pillar one side is, is usually represented by a, um, a somewhat um, tenuous metric. It's either the, uh, the fixed overhead requirement or it's, uh, it's a slightly more involved operational risk requirement uh, based on revenues over the past three years. Now, these are obviously proxies for operational risk, and they, they do scale with the size of the firm. Um, but clearly, the nature of the firm itself can be uh, can be really quite different. Um, you know, you've got a, a whole spectrum from uh, high-frequency traders through to um, possibly private equity firms, which only do one or two deals a month. Um, so really, the, the, the modeling technique uh, to be used um, will vary very much from a, a sort of single point of failure modeling, um, very much an IT driven thing, right across to uh, a far more qualitative model. Um, I don't have any particular views on which model is the best, um, but certainly uh, the, the, uh, the nature of model should be described within the ICAP, and I think the FCA would be uh, certainly far more comfortable if it saw um, more more formalized methodologies included in ICAP for Pillar 1. I think one of the basic problems is that previously that there's, no, um, there's no marks being given for working, as it were, um, and, uh, and I think uh, that something that is uh, repeatable and testable under different scenarios will be of uh, very great interest to the FCA. Great, thank you very much. Just to help you along as well, I have um, printed my um, email address into the group chat, so you can just copy and paste it there. Just send me an email requesting the slides so we can get that sent across to you. Um, again, thank you very much to Gerard, Tom and Richard for joining us on the webinar today, and thank you very much to all of you who attended. Have a very good day. Thank you. Goodbye.